Hi, I'm Avinash Manta. Um, so I'm a geriatrician. Um, for those who know me, I work over at the Edward Hines VA Medical Center. Um, I have a geriatric practice. I also work with the Geriatric Fellowship pretty heavily today. Um, and I'm honored to be moderating this talk, uh, which is being given by Dr. Raj Shah, one of my colleagues and friends who, if you're in the world of geriatrics, he needs no introduction here in Illinois. Um, so um, he works heavily with the Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center. He is a professor of medicine, has done a lot of research about longevity and about disability-free survival uh, with Alzheimer's disease. So we're just going to go through some introduction slides here and more sort of housekeeping. Um, so this CME activity will meet Illinois' continuing medical education requirements for physician license renewal for recognizing dementia. And this is a relatively new requirement from um, statewide here in Illinois. Um, next up, if you have not listened to the Brain Trust series, um, it is very good. Um, it is a physician's practical guide to the early detection of Alzheimer's and related dementias. Um, and Dr. Shaw, as well as UK Shranjit, who works um, in Illinois as well, he works downstate, down in Springfield. They are the hosts um, of this series, and I've been fortunate to be on twice to talk about veteran populations and about my experiences. Um, and I think we're up to about 18, 19 episodes by now. So, um, it's quite good, and I think really sort of gives family doctors a lot of tools to sort of feel more comfortable with these diagnoses as we're going to have to, in the world when we all have more aging patients as family doctors, we are those, you know, first lines and, and to feel more comfortable with that making a diagnosis of dementia. Um, and so for the talk, all attendees are in listen only mode and all questions will be entered through our chat feature and i will read these questions at the end of our presentation uh and this presentation is being recorded um all discussions questions and answers will be a part of the recording so of course if you want to go back to listen to it later that would be great um so for our cme credit um, and the link to report CME will be given in our chat, uh, and you must complete the post-test and evaluation. Um, and here's our support. So the Brain Trust is a project which is administered by the Illinois Academy of Family Physicians. And the funding for the project and the webinar was made possible by a grant from the Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, next up through accreditation, uh, the Illinois Academy of Family Physicians is accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical, for continuing medical Education, sorry, to provide continuing medical education for physicians. So it's webinar credit designation, it is a MAPRA category one, uh, as in internet live activity for a maximum of one AMA credit and also a AAFP prescribed credit. Um, and the online enduring credit designation, the Illinois Academy of Family Physicians designates this online enduring material for a maximum of one AMA PRA credit, um, as well as a AAFP prescribed enduring credit designation. Um, okay, so for disclosures, of course, the IAFP adheres to a conflict of interest policy of the ACCME and the AMA. It is the policy of the Illinois AFP to ensure balance, independence, objectivity, and scientific rigor in all of its educational activities. Uh, so for 
Our speaker, Dr. Shah. Dr. Shah reports no relevant financial disclosures related to this presentation. He does report that in the last two years that he has been a non-compensated member of the Illinois, De of the Illinois, Illinois Department of Public Health Alzheimer's Disease Advisory Board, which was nominated by the Illinois Academy of Family Physicians, and has also been the site principal investigator. Uh, so for clinical trials with his institution, Rush University Medical Center, and is compensated for those. And this presentation is without bias. And there's no conflict of interest for Dr. Shah to present this information. Um, and IFP's inclusion and diversity statement, which of course you can read, and we are committed to inclusion, equity, and diversity in all of our features. Um, and next onto our presentation. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Banta, for that introduction. And I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, if you wouldn't mind um, stopping to share, then I can do that, thank you. And let me just get my presentation up and running. Okay, I think hopefully everybody can see my presentation screen. Um, okay, so um, again, hopefully, uh, Dr. Manta, you can hear me okay as I'm speaking. Yeah. Yes, see yes, your screen like and yes. we can hear you. Yes, okay, like perfect. Okay, so yeah, let's um, uh, talk in our second uh, webinar of the Brain Trust series and extend what we were learning in our first series about the early diagnosis and detection of uh, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And in this, you know, it's a very complex process with multiple steps, but we're trying to break it down here and to give different aspects of what we've learned and where we can maybe go next as um, in family medicine and in primary care uh, to uh, continue to encourage and work with our persons living with ADRD or at risk for it and their caregivers. Um, so my disclosures were already provided by Dr. Manta. And then um, our learning objectives today are really going to be how do we start thinking about what are these key elements we can do to help people through this journey, especially around the detection process and then developing a care plan. And many of us may have learned this a while back ago, but have kind of lost track of some of the principles around primary care. Um, and this concept of where the first point of care and access were involved in continuity and in coordination and providing comprehensive services. And we'd like to kind of think through how do we uh, approach this entire process of uh, diagnosis and detection and developing a care plan with that lens in mind. And then how do we develop a trustworthy relationship building um, uh, that is going to be culturally and contextually tailored to meet the needs of individuals in our communities? And then also, how are we fitting our clinical work, our primary care clinics, and where we uh, participate and engage with individuals and their families with the community and the community resources that might be available over time? Um, so, you know, what we'll do is um, I'll maybe ask one or two introductory questions in the chat, um, and if people want to answer uh, as they're doing that, and then you please use the chat to put any questions along the way, and we'll leave some time near the end for a, a moderated session where we can go through the questions. So before I get into the presentation, um, which is focused on how do we make our settings, our primary care clinics, more dementia friendly in their processes of helping people uh, develop a diagnosis and a, a plan of care. I'm, I'm, I wanted to just ask in the chat if people would just type in, do they think where they practice right now is optimally dementia friendly? And if people want to put that in while we continue the conversation, that would be great. Uh, and if you have some idea, if you answer yes or no, why you think that way, you know, uh, just put in, like, I think my practice is dementia friendly because, or I think we're not necessarily dementia friendly because. Um, and we'll come back to that in our discussion at the end uh, as we go forward. All right, so what we're gonna do in today's agenda and the, the, the time we have for about uh, 40 minutes or so, or a little bit less than that, is to really kind of go over a few pieces around um, 
uh, what we learned in our first webinar together so that we were all on the same page uh, because I'm not positive if everybody had a chance to see the first presentation. If you haven't, it's still there on the Brain Trust website I, and I would recommend going back and, and listening to the full discussion and conversation. But I'll give a little snippet so we can start on the same page. And then I want to talk through a little bit about the diagnostic journey. What's the ideal that people have been painting? What's the reality? And then how do we fit in in the primary care clinic settings? Uh, and then I want to broach like maybe some uh, thought processes around how we can maybe utilize our strengths in primary care and our underlying foundation, what was uh, designed and thought about in the 1970s and early 80s by Barbara Starfield, uh, who was engaged in sort of the def definition of primary care called the four C's of primary care. And then how do we tie that in with things that we're concerned about now about age-friendly health systems and this concept of four M's? Um, and, and we'll see how they may play together. And then we'll take that information and the diagnostic journey and bring it into how do we build or, th or think through the the concepts that will help us to make a more dementia-friendly primary care location. And then finally, how do we fit this primary care clinic that we're trying to build as part of a broader initiative called Dementia-Friendly Communities? All right, so let's start with that recap and just kind of go over what we know uh, and what we've been working our way through in early detection and diagnosis. Um, so the we should be anticipating that there'll be a new 2024 Alzheimer's disease facts and figures coming out in the next month or so. But the most recent update was from uh, early last year, from 2023 estimates. And uh, we are estimating as of 2023, there are 6.7 million Americans that have Alzheimer's disease. Now, all, there is this Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, other dementias than Alzheimer's disease. And we think that number is even broader when you think through um, uh, dementia um, rather than just one component of dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we know by itself, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias or disorders are the third most costly disease in the United States uh, behind uh, heart disease and cancer. And we, out of that 6.7 million individuals 65 and older, and there are younger individuals that get Alzheimer's disease before the age of 65, about 200,000 individuals is what we estimate. Um, we, we think that um, the majority, over almost 75% of individuals living with Alzheimer's disease in the United States now are over the age of 75. Um, so they bring on some unique other properties of social uh, care needs, uh, community dynamics, uh, and that we have to work through, not only that they're having difficulties with dementia or chronic thinking problems. And we know some of the struggle is going to get bigger because uh, the estimates even moving forward are that by uh, 2050, we're going to essentially double the number of people from about 6.7 million to about 13 million individuals living with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and even now, we're in this, pri in this situation where about 55 percent of primary care physicians feel there's not enough dementia care specialists in their community to meet the current patient demand. Um, so we have a, a, a true public health issue uh, that requires, um, uh, you know, uh, attention to individuals that are um, older and might uh, require more engagement and services, and uh, that we don't always have uh, the support teams and the specialists that can just handle this by themselves, and, um, and we know that this is going to be an increasing problem. And if we Take it back and just look not only nationally, but what's happening in the state of Illinois. Uh, we estimate that by 2025, you know, a year, two years from now, we're going to be at about 260,000 individuals estimated to be over age 65 uh, that uh, will be living with Alzheimer's disease. And that will be about a 13% increase even from five years before. Um, we know that it not only affects those individuals, the 260,000 individuals with Alzheimer's disease, but uh, a myriad of caregivers uh, that have to be involved. And in general, there's usually thought to be like one main caregiver that's assigned. And that's why they said like unpaid caregivers, there's about 312,000 of them in Illinois. 
But we realize there's also a loose network of individuals, friends, other family members from different generations that might be involved in uncared pay, uh, uh, caregiving resources to help somebody with dementia and to be their partners through the experience. And even if you try to estimate the hours of unpaid care, it's quite staggering um, at about 400, almost 500 million hours a year, and uh, that it, it's about $10 billion of our economy is provided with unpaid care needs. And that has an effect on caregivers and uh, the way they also are dealing with their chronic conditions and their health situations. Um, we, we know um, there's unfortunately a higher rate of readmission in a person that has dementia to a hospital system, which also is a little bit more difficult for the recovery and well-being. And in Medicare in general, the per capita spending for persons living with dementia is about 31, almost $32,000 a year. All right. And then we have some older data that's being updated by the IDPH um, uh, through their annual, uh, their sort of semi, uh, every two year surveys that they do called the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Study. And the big key figure here that I wanted to bring out is what I highlighted on the bottom, which is even though we know this is a bigger problem, there's many people we estimate that have this condition. When we do these random digit dial calls uh, in our public health system to older persons and ask them if they've been noticing any difficulties with increased confusion or memory loss, we get, we get about 37%, uh, about 12, uh, um, something like a, on order of uh, 1.2 million households where there's some report of uh, this experience, about you know, 40% of them or about f 5 million, uh, you know, households where uh, that might be a, a person that's having some restriction in activities. But the problem is, is that most people aren't talking about it, or at least they're saying they're not talking about it with their uh, healthcare providers about their cognitive and functional concerns. And this is what maybe, you know, we're trying to work on in the long run around the early detection and diagnosis is how can we reduce that uh, time that it takes for people to notice a concern, to feel confident bringing that concern up, and, and then to go through the diagnostic journey. Um, we know that, you know, dementia is part of a cognitive spectrum, um, uh, and we, we put these cut points artificially by some uh, common definitions we have between what is sort of normal cognition as people age, what, where does it become a point where there's cognitive problems, but it's not necessarily impacting their day-to-day -day life, which is what we call mild cognitive impairment, and then when we get to a dementia. Um, and in general terms, and I'm still using DSM-4 because I think it is the, uh, the best definitions of uh, how to rate this in clinical care, is that it's dementia is this chronic cognitive loss where people have deficits in multiple areas of cognition, um, uh, including uh, memory plus other domains like language and executive functions or, or planning activities, um, wayfinding, um, visual spatial skills. Those are all parts of the things that could uh, not work well if somebody has a dementia. And the key is it's not um, it's causing significant social or occupational or functional decline, and we can't explain it by something acutely changing, which is what we call a delirium, and we can't explain it by another disorder such as depression or a, another chronic health condition that could be presenting with cognitive changes. Um, and it's a real challenge, right, for us to be able to work through how do we understand if somebody comes up to us and says, Doc, I'm having memory troubles, uh, to be able to separate that out into what could be these other conditions, what could be acute events, uh, where could people fit on the spectrum of uh, having uh, normal to MCI to dementia, how could that be impacted by uh, medication side effects? And if we get to a diagnosis of dementia, what could be the key driver? The most common type of dementia is a mixed dementia. And most dementias have some component of Alzheimer's disease with it um, as one of the pathologies in the brain. But we do know there's other pathologies that come together like changes of vascular and stroke or Lewy body, which is associated with Parkinson's disease, along with changes in the tau protein, which can cause frontal temporal dementia. And in our last session, and people can go back to this, the one thing I was learning or a rule of thumb or what I've been trying to educate about to try to make this a bit easier of a process to triage is to think about three key questions when you're evaluating somebody with memory loss. Um, and does this individual have a chronic cognition problem? 
If not, then there might be an acute problem like a delirium we have to address, or it could be that they're in this, the phase of normal cognition that we have to follow them and, and just engage them to come back so that we can see if changes are happening. But if we think there's a chronic lasting more than six months, rule of thumb, you know, being caused by, um, uh, you know, affecting their thinking uh, in two domains and uh, affecting their quality of life, that gets us to do I think they have a dementia? Yes, if it's affecting their uh, functional abilities and MCI if it's not. And then we go through the because it's so common to have AD pathology within it um, or Alzheimer's disease pathology driving it. We ask if the person has the characteristics that would most likely fit with a slow progressive decline associated with Alzheimer's disease uh, versus some other features that we could make us be red flags for other conditions that can cause dementias. And really our key is we're trying to be there and uh, the biggest phase of this is there's no blood tests we have right now that's gonna be able to diagnose this and, um, and there's no imaging study that's gonna be able to do this for us. So we have to depend on our, our, our capabilities as clinicians to listen and inquire about what might be going on and using that to drive us answering those three questions along with this uh, physical exam and some very basic tests. And really in the end, what we wanna do with all that information is to make the diagnosis of what we think might be going on, a working diagnosis, and then taking sort of this person-centered approach where the person with cognitive loss and their caregivers are in the middle of how we try to develop a care plan, uh, followed by sort of their you know, primary uh, healthcare services or ancillary services and their community legal and social services that we have to plan for. All right, but we know there's barriers from those patients and their families in going through this. We know there's barriers at us delivering this care as healthcare providers and working through the diagnosis. And we know there's barriers even in community settings around how to coordinate this care uh, over time. Uh, and these are the challenges we all have to work through and what will be starting to continue our development uh, now that I've given an overview of sort of what we talked about in our first session. So we're all on the same page. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this diagnosis journey. And, and what I wanna do is I wanna start with, you know, some of the, in the last report, last year's Alzheimer's facts and figures, as there were some new um, indications coming out for approvals of new treatments against amyloid um, that were being FDA approved for commercialization. Um, people started thinking about, you know, what is this way of going from having concerns as a patient to getting a diagnosis and starting a treatment plan, especially with these new um, agents that require a little bit more uh, interventions and testing to make sure they're the right candidate for them. And what strikes me is, you know, the pattern is reasonable, uh, written by the Alzheimer's Association in their document as a special feature of somebody starting with cognitive concerns, seeing their, P their primary care provider for initial visit to do some of those things we talked about in the last piece about getting the initial history, doing the exam, ordering some lab test, uh, you know, um, seeing some basic screening tools that might be predicting if somebody's uh, having uh, documented troubles in the memory. Um, and then, you know, potentially to have to, you know, get support and help uh, by other practitioners and specialists, such as geriatricians, neurologists, geriatric psychiatrists, uh, if there's an inkling that this is just not normal and it's not uh, delirium. Um, and then, you know, potentially doing some more, uh, if it's early in the process, doing some more diagnostic imaging and testing to see about amyloid in the brain, uh, and then eventually deciding if there's enough of this amyloid uh, and the diagnosis is made to consider some of the treatment options that might be available, and then sort of a co-management of care of uh, some of these treatments that might become. And what strikes me is like, I look at things visually and think about diagrams. And if you notice something about this diagram, there's this indication like every, every step is like the same uh, width, right, or the same height. So it, it's, it, it kind of simplifies a message and says, you know, the time it takes to go through each of the steps are the same, and that um, the importance and the amount of information that has to be done at that stage of gathering information to make decision making is, is alike. Um, and that's probably very idealistic. And the reason why I say it's idealistic is this. Uh, there was a study um, done um, uh, as a kind of quantitative, uh, qualitative study of talking with individuals, about 150 care partners, 
uh, 100 patients with MCI or mild Alzheimer's disease, uh, primary care physicians and geriatricians in the United States. And they walk through like, okay, what is the common journey and tell us about your experiences and what sort of happens. And in reality, they kind of got to a sense, at least in this cohort that they interviewed in the common medical journey, symptom onset starts somewhere about age 71 or 72, which could be very fitting um, with the ranges of what we see where the prevalence is higher. But even getting from that first stage of noticing symptoms to seeing the initial discussion with the PCP, that can be up to 15 months. Um, and then from the time of uh, working with that initial PCP, and you'll see only about 64% of the time it was with the PCP, some of that time people jumped over that system uh, and, and went directly to other care providers. Um, but going from that initial discussion, hey, I think I'm having memory problems, to a diagnosis was about four months. And the PCP was involved in providing that diagnosis about 33% of the time. And even the time from diagnosis to initial treatment plan could sometimes be delayed by about a month. Um, and so we don't have the same time frames in each of these stages. And um, uh, there's a lot of issues that have to go on to make this entire process work, uh, that we have to be on this journey with our patients and participants. So the, the more striking thing I thought that came out was one of these messages at the bottom, because I'll come back to this, which is although 74% of PCPs, the ones they interviewed, the 101 primary care physicians, viewed themselves as coordinators of care, which fits with that entire four C's model for their patients with MCI or mild AD dementia, only 37% of care partners viewed them as such. So we have this disconnect between what we think is being delivered as primary care physicians in our clinics around coordination of care and how patients and care partners are viewing that. Um, similarly, like we have that disconnect with people seeing symptoms but not talking with their doctors about it. Um, and if we can break through those two barriers, right, that first 19 months, if we can figure out how to reduce those timeframes, the better we're gonna get at early diagnosis and detection and to help uh, uh, create a smoother system over time. All right, the other thing I wanna bring up and I'm gonna come back and Dr. Manta also introduced this earlier is we have these podcasts um, that we've been doing with the Brain Trust. And starting with episode 19 that just got released about a week ago, uh, we're starting a little mini series around um, talking with caregivers of people with dementia that have been part of a group called Without Warning. These are for individuals that have early uh, young onset uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is usually before the age of 65. And we've conducted uh, five of these interviews in the mini series, and they're about to be released. This is the first one. But you know, some of the same messaging we were seeing in that article about the process, uh, when we asked these uh, individuals to share their stories, some were from rural areas, some were in urban areas, um, uh, some represented other communities of uh, diversity that we participate and work with, um, we, we got similar messages and there were a few features that came out that I'll refer back to when we go into like, well, how do we help patients through this uh, dementia diagnosis journey to get to a care plan? Um, but I would recommend, exp you know, if you get a chance to uh, supplement the material we're learning now, and what I share today by listening to some of these podcasts, especially starting with episode 19 and going through about episode 23, because I think we learn as uh, physicians over time from our patients and their experiences uh, and hearing these stories from real people um, going through real situations, the good and the bad, uh, can help us to kind of figure out what could be a more dementia friendly network or system. All right, so in the end, uh, you know, summarizing what we know about the condition and what we try to do abstractly with how we make the diagnosis to what we know about that journey process, um, you know, we, I still feel and I, I, I posit that dementia is a true primary care condition. We can't just eliminate primary care providers for, as a step in this entire process of working with patients or persons living with dementia, their families and their communities and connecting them into a diagnostic pathway. And in most cases, primary care physicians are actually involved in making the diagnosis. Uh, you know, sometimes they need help, they need advice from other people, and they're trying to do their best under the current constraints of our systems that we have. 
But uh, our exploration now is going to shift to how might we build on the strengths of what we've been doing up till now with primary care provider teams and physician teams to make this diagnostic journey uh, more friendly. To, how do we shorten this time, make it more uh, for quality uh, and patient satisfaction and provider satisfaction experience um, so that uh, people feel connected uh, throughout the process and they're getting the best answers possible in their shared decision-making. All right, so now we'll go back and this is a little bit about what could we use as our tools to help us to think about a pathway um, uh, moving forward with dementia uh, friendly. So um, I, I wanna go back to a National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine report from 2021. Uh, that was a follow-up uh, from about a report done 20 years before about implementing high quality primary care and rebuilding the foundation of healthcare. And I just share what they said about what is like high quality primary care. And what they say is it's the provision of whole person Whole person health focuses on well-being rather than the absence of disease. It accounts for the mental, physical, emotional, spiritual health, and social determinants of health for a person. It's integrated, it's accessible, and equitable health care by intra-professional teams who are accountable for addressing the majority of an individual's health and wellness needs across settings and through sustained relationships with patients, families, and communities. So these were some of the ideas and concepts we've already started to bring up um, and trying to explore. And we know this is so part and parcel of what we do and are trained in primary care, family medicine, um, to really work through um, in making these connections to provide this high quality primary care. And this model that was created in the 1970s and 80s in the early stages of making the specialty of family medicine from general practice um, really started to uh, talk about these four C's. Now, people have advanced these four C's into some. I've seen seven C's. I've seen nine C's. But I want to go back to the four C's because it's a simple enough model, and it's even complex at four C's. Um, but it's the idea that we're the first contact, right? Like even in that journey diagram, we see that most people after that 15 months or so, the first people they talk with are in a primary care setting, their primary care physicians and their teams about noticing memory changes and wanting to start the diagnostic process. But there is a need also to provide um, a comprehensiveness of the evaluation um, and how we go to making the diagnosis and building a comprehensive treatment plan. And then there's issues around continuity. How do we help to help people with these like little episodes that they have to check in and do like those little bars that we were showing before um, in the process? How do we make them feel more continuous and nothing gets dropped and a discontinuity occurs in this um, activity and people get lost a little bit in the shuffle? And that involves that coordination. And we know that these four concepts actually play off of each other. And this is a nice paper and a diagram talking about some of those interrelationships. For instance, we know that things such as, you know, um, uh, if we need help by a specialist, having a good diagnosis and referral skills can improve comprehensiveness, but good coordination can also make sure we get the best answers for our patients without getting them more confused. We also know that continuity can help with speeding some of the uh, improving access to faster care and vice versa. Uh, and then we see the relationships on the outside of each of these components too. All right, so that there's a four C's framework that is foundational to what we do in primary care. And then there's been this newer uh, activity over the last decade, decade and a half called the Age-Friendly Health System Network that was put together by uh, funds from the Hartford Foundation and the uh, Institute of Healthcare Improvement. And they've been thinking about what is important in aging. And if you want to have a chance to listen more to that, we just did, uh, as part of the member interest group uh, session uh, that's been uh, put together as one of our evening webinars that has some uh, uh, capabilities to talk about how this 4Ms framework happens and how geriatricians that are trained in primary care initially think through these issues about improving mentation, what matters most, medication and mobility. And even though today is about dementia, which you think would be like, oh, we're just talking about 1M, we're just talking about the dementia. 
In reality, dementia holds multiple of these other components. We have to think about in mentation, how is somebody doing with other activities uh, such as behavior? We have to think in mobility, how are they functioning uh, to improve their functional abilities? We have to talk about what matters to the caregiver and the uh, individual to reduce stresses and burdens. And we have to talk about medications and non-medication treatments that we give and help people through this pathway. So there's a linkage between the four C's and the four M's and actually with the way we approve or think about what we want medications to do or treatments to do in Alzheimer's disease. And this is even some of the reporting out of the common features and sort of what, how the uh, Food and Drug Administration thinks about uh, metrics to see if a, a treatment that they regulate could be helpful. We not only want to improve somebody's cognition or slow down the loss of cognitive function, but we want to make sure that that helps with maintaining functionality. We want to reduce behaviors that can come as a function of losing uh, cognition and, and being more isolated. And we want to reduce that caregiver burden. And we have to do this with education, social services, medications. Um, and here's how, you know, in a quick way, I'm saying that maybe the four C's and four M's can come together in that diagnostic process of care that we were showing that uh, was outlined after interviewing multiple individuals in this article in 2023. And so a highlight, like, okay, there, the pieces of like first contact, right? It ties in directly with that initial discussion with the PCP. So there is something that goes on in those 15 months that gets people to get comfortable to have that first contact point. There's comprehensiveness in how we get a diagnosis together and then eventually take that comprehensiveness of the diagnosis to help us with the treatment plan. There's coordination because there could be multiple people, as we see in these diagrams. It's not just the PCP, but there might be geriatricians, there might be neurologists, there might be geropsychologists, there might be other people involved in the pathway to help us to make that diagnosis. Laboratory, imaging specialists, there's people and, and they're generating data and information and we have to coordinate that experience uh, for persons going through that. Um, and then there's continuity, right? Th through this entire process of sometimes over two years, we, we always think, oh, we made the detection and diagnosis in one session, but it takes sometimes uh, approximately two years to get there. Um, there's continuity in how people feel connected to feel follow-up and services. And then we take all of that information and we work on like, how do we build the best plan that's gonna help somebody as a care to reduce that caregiver burden, to reduce that co uh, cognitive loss, uh, to improve behavioral and to improve function. And that all ties in with the key four M's with what matters is some of the questions around the caregiver burden and how do we reduce that. Um, mentation is about cognitive and behavioral maintenance. Mobility is about functional ma maintenance and medications is part of how that fits in the entire picture of some of these other medications and treatments so that they can be manageable and achieve their best success rate possible. Okay, so now let's take that kind of conceptual model where we plastered on, um, you know, the, the four C's and the four M's, and then what we want out of a good dementia care plan uh, to address, right, behaviors, function, cognition, um, and then caregiver burden. And how do we start building this into our primary care clinical settings and the experiences individuals have there? Um, so here's the first thing that I wanted to go is just our overall goal, right? Like what do we really want to do here is we want to figure out a way when it actually comes to persons living with or at risk for dementia, how do we deliver a culturally safe and competent primary care services to meet the needs of that group? So in order to do that in, in any kind of friendly way, we need to think through um, some of the things, like how well does we as physicians and our teams have greater knowledge about the health and services that are required uh, to put a good plan together diagnostically and for treatment, and that we tailor those culturally and contextually to the diverse communities that we serve. And how, if we can do that, and, and we can start delivering on some of those aspects, we can increase sort of the trust in our healthcare delivery in our primary care setting, that we are a resource. We are a fundamental part of the picture of what has to be done in the diagnostic and treatment plan. 
And eventually that helps us to improve our communication channels so that we can connect people with people that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis as our patients and the families that provide us or help them. Uh, and then also how do we connect them to service providers in our community so we don't feel all alone in having to address these issues uh, where we need other help, other support to reduce some of the stigma families face. All right. So how do we do that? Well, you know, and some of the principles are really to think through developing that culturally competent care that's contextually um, put into play is we think in a dementia friendly clinic, there's sort of three key areas. Uh, we think about environmental design, we think about inclusion, and we think about appropriate services and they interact with each other. Most of the efforts in the writing, not in primary care itself, and when I was researching for this article, um, uh, focus on how to develop dementia-friendly spaces that are based in clinical settings, but mainly in like the hospital uh, they're starting, but it's been mainly in the residential uh, sheltered care situations. How do you work on it? And most of the emphasis has been working with in, you know, designers, uh, architects, about how do you change the environmental env design? But that's really only one piece of the puzzle. You can have the best looking facility possible that's designed to support and to maintain people's function with the tools we have, uh, you know, in our um, in our made man-made world um, and in our way we design places uh, and spaces. But if we don't necessarily have a space where people feel included by individuals that are working with them, and we don't necessarily have a space that's developing the appropriate services, we might be missing the entire picture here. Um, and so inclusion is really about, you know, the combination of uh, how do we achieve uh, dementia-friendly health care spaces along with environmental design and appropriate services. And so the things we think about, and, you know, if I had asked you, like, oh, you know, what, what could we do in our own practice, many of you would come with these ideas, and it's not a bad place to start which is to imagine yourself walking through the front door of your clinic as somebody who's experiencing memory troubles and thinking about how are they gonna interact and figure out how to open that door to get into the clinic in the first place? How are they gonna find your place, clinic, right? Know it's the right place, walk in the right door. How are they gonna get to that front desk and be able to check in? And what happens at the front desk when somebody's like saying, sign this form, sign this form, sign this form, or, you know, and, and they give them the electronic pen, you know, with the signature, how is that going to work? And then how are they going to get roomed and called out? Um, how are they going to stay in their room? Maybe they have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the room. How are they going to find the bathroom and get back to their room um, in the space that you have? Um, uh, how are we going to prevent people to keep them safe that even if they do something like that, we don't lose track of them. They they walk away because they get confused, and then we have to call like a code um, silver. You know, that's uh, one you know, or something like that in our hospital, or code gray, or uh, you know, whatever the code terms we used right now, where uh, somebody gets lost. That's an older adult. Um, that is, by the way, the worst feeling you can ever have in your day is to lose somebody that has dementia in your hospital or health system setting. Um, and but how do we work on you know setting up our environment so that can't necessarily happen? Um, and then how do we create a safe environment and a space that people can work on? So people think about, you know, there's ways we can do that by making the place more friendly, by uh, acoustics. If there's a lot of loud sounds, that's why ERs are so tough for older adults with dementia, because there's those bells and signals all the time that makes it a little bit more confusing. Um, uh, how do we deal with colors uh, and, and uh, distinguishing between colors if we're going through different spaces? Uh, sometimes older adults with visuospatial difficulties with dementia may interpret like something that looks black on the floor, like four black tiles, as a pool of water. And they might try to avoid that. So how do we think about that in our clinic spaces? How do we think about having adequate lighting or making sure nobody can trip over anything if they're having troubles with their mobility and walking with their dementia? And signage and our washrooms. Our washrooms are always a place where people can get into safety issues, uh, even if they have normal cognition, but potentially even worse if they don't. Um, and then we have to think about all these elements, these design elements, how do we combine them together to create that movement flow, that furnishing uh, where people feel comfortable to talk about things, where you, the physician, and the team also feels comfortable about creating an environment to share and to learn together, and then these physical configurations to maintain safety and independence of function. All right. 
And then when it comes to appropriate services, um, how do we deliver like what that model is? Like, remember, I said, uh, one of the key factors you have to do right now is, is to listen, to spend time collecting that history. So I found this really interesting work in this space, not in the United States, but in Australia. Um, and some of the other work has been in Canada. But one of their things they did through their um, uh, nursing work uh, in one of their district nursing societies is to think through this manual of information about what would be a culturally appropriate way of taking history. Um, and how do you build in time and respect and empathy and maintain privacy and engagement uh, and safety? And they came up with this acronym about respect. Uh, and they said, recognize, you know, let's recognize who's coming into our spaces uh, and the background. And that's why I think social history is so important to be able to understand who's coming into your space and, and to have that knowledge about them. And that's one of the strengths in primary care is we get to spend that time to learn who people are and where they're from and their experiences. Um, how do we make sure we have empathy for somebody who's having difficulties with memory to make it a better place uh, for them to be comfortable? Because it's a scary thought when you have to share uh, your responsibilities the first time you engage with somebody. And then how do we think about the safety of that person where they feel like their information is going to be kept confidential and that they will be willing to engage and listen to us and, you know, and provide us the information so we can make the best diagnosis possible. And then how do we do this in the timing and setting of uh, capabilities that we want to deliver? Um, and then the final thing is, how do we kind of think through inclusion? And here's where I want to come back to something I was hearing. Um, there's this, uh, it came out of some of the nursing home literature, but this idea of citizenship. Um, and it's um, it's a broader citizenship in practice, not necessarily a citizenship like, you know, you meet certain inclusion exclusion criteria to belong to a certain group, uh, but rather how do we maintain relationships between each other at different levels that we can create a sense of belonging and identity? Um, and there's like four levels that they bring out in these models of sort of citizenship. And one is a micro level, one is sort of a mid-size level, one is a macro, and one's a meta. Today, I'm going to concentrate on the micro level, which is the action on the part of individuals that will generate a high level of participation and a greater willingness to support others. And I want to focus on this because one of the key messages we heard about some of that delay that goes on in those 15 months between the time a family member starts noticing something might be wrong with the memory or even the person themselves may start noticing things is it takes a while to navigate a space where they feel confident to talk with their primary care doctor about it. So if you hear some of those podcasts we did, there were messages like, I started by caregivers. I started noticing changes and he noticed changes too. So I told him to go see our primary care doctor uh, for his regular visit and to bring up the memory loss. But I'd never accompanied him to those visits. It would be rare. We had the visits separately. So the first onus is like, okay, well, the person, even though they're noticing these changes, like any other problem, if they had a physical problem, they would be comfortable enough to go to their doctor, talk about it, and start the conversation, and then come back and tell their caregiver what happened. Uh, but what they usually found is that they would try that a couple times, and it never worked. The conversation never came up. And then they were negotiating about how, how am I as a caregiver going to do that? And most people, the way they did it is they just showed up for the meeting with the primary doctor. So now you have the primary doctor has been meeting with the person with all, with now at risk for Alzheimer's disease or concerns about Alzheimer's disease. They were meeting separately for years. And now you have a spouse or another family member walking into the room. Then that throws off the, the, the primary doctor. That throws off the relationship because now you're not dealing with two, you're dealing with three. And there's a different sort of interaction and engagement. Um, but what could we have done differently, right? Like to be able to open up that engagement. So like one thought after listening to this I had, and I just throw it out there, is what if we created like this poster that would be up there with like a finger, like an index finger with a ribbon around it and said, oh, remember that your wife asked you to talk with me about your uh, memory troubles? I'm here. Why don't we talk, right? And if you had that poster there while they were sitting and waiting for you to come in, would that trigger them to talk with you? Right. And, and maybe make it a little bit easier. And then you could say, oh, I'm glad you brought that up. 
And, you know, maybe we can have a visit where your wife can come too, and we can listen to this all together. And so then it takes the pressure off to make it a little bit easier to make that connection where now it's a group of three, maybe four, maybe five that are working together to help that person as they go through the diagnostic pathway. How can we make it easier so we don't, people don't have to even ask that question because we ask the question by using things that we have tools like our annual wellness visit where we can ask about cognition. And we say, you know, it's just part of what we do every year. So I'm gonna ask you about your cognition and just see how you're doing. And then if we are, you're mentioning something that, you know, is a little bit more of concern, we know we can go down that pathway and work through it. So that's what I talk about these like micro level citizenships. How can we create that sense of belonging at a very simple level of not only dealing with, you know, like, do we have the right colors and the right, like, you know, tiles and everything like that and wayfinding signs, but can we actually have things that make it easier for the family to connect with us? How can we make it so that the family could be comfortable to send a message to us and the front desk to say, I'm a little bit concerned about memory. Is there a way we can talk with you about it and start meeting? Um, how do we allow for those things to happen a little bit more easily? All right. And then the other thing we realize is that one size does not fit all and all situations and all contexts. And that came out very clearly in our discussions. When you're dealing in a community of uh, 500, where somebody's a sheep farmer in rural Illinois, or you're dealing with somebody that's uh, you know working in an urban place, it's a very different feel. But some of the key things that were messages around this is that it didn't really matter. Like we could take all the pieces and all the tips that we have and try to concatenate them in a uniform process, but we'll always have to adjust it for our local environments to meet the needs of the community where they're at and what is going on. And that is about how do we think about the cultural and linguistic diverse communities we serve and have a vision of them that are experiencing dementia and memory loss, that their voices can be heard, that will support them through that, and they can have a meaningful life through that process and understand more about those cultural pieces as we engage so we can help them uh, to navigate spaces. Things like, okay, what am I going to do? We had a conversation in one of our uh, podcasts uh, you know, on providing services in a, in a community that uh, had multiple linguistic um, uh, uh, languages spoken in their setting, how do you deal with having to have a, a way of doing a test like a mini mental it, that you might have to give an Urdu once and then you might have to give to the next patient in um, an Arabic language? Um, you know, it is hard, right, when you're dealing in a multicultural space and having appropriate tools and work has been going on to generate some of those appropriate uh, tools over time for different groups so that they can be beneficial and used. Um, so we have to think our way through that. And then the final piece, so I'm giving you some suggestions based on the conversation. The one thing that the caregivers that we talked to really valued was that their physician was part of that continuity, that they spent time with them and explained each step like, okay, I'm sending you for the MRI now. The MRI will tell us some results. When I get the result, I'll give you a call back, right? Like they felt that that was an important connection. What they also valued is that spending time with the caregiver and thinking about the caregiver separately. And one way we could change and become more dementia friendly is to ask people, do, are they caring for somebody that might be having memory problems? So identify the caregiver and that will help you to identify who might be the care recipient, the person that's having the memory problems. And then the more we can help the caregiver and reduce their burdens, the better we do as a practice in making our, our clinic more dementia friendly. So the simple things we can do, we can turn them around and we can make a difference in making our clinic more dementia friendly. And what does this all mean? We can't do it by ourselves, even as a clinic. We can't be an island in, in a way, you know, with nothing around us, uh, but we never usually are. And there's communities that are working with us to make it better over time. And there's been an entire process about becoming uh, dementia-friendly communities, and Illinois is part of that uh, national effort. And we have uh, almost 33 communities that have gone through the process of being recognized as dementia-friendly. Um, I always find this picture, it's always hard to you know, draw, right? A picture of what you think a dementia-friendly community is and what you leave in and what you leave out. Um, what is so, somewhat underemphasized in this picture, if you want to write in the chat box a little bit, uh, and then we'll close up. Um, uh, and uh, think about it for a second, and then I'll tell you what I noticed. All right, what I noticed is this. We have a picture here, and we show like a cross to represent maybe a hospital, but it's labeled as 
care throughout the continuum. But what we miss is where's that care? It's not going to be at the hospital as the first place. It's going to be at a primary care clinic. Um, and I couldn't resist but sharing the picture of a Norman Rockwell painting from the early days of uh, him visiting a primary care physician in town and what that looked like in the 1900s and compared to some of our clinical spaces now that we have around the world. But I would love for this picture to be changed from a hospital to a primary care clinic or to have that component added in sort of the care process because it is fundamental that the primary care clinic connects the health system with the community. Um, and, you know, in the end, what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect our clinic with all those community providers so everyone in a community can navigate uh, and feel connected and not isolated if they're having worsening memory, because we know isolation leads to worse uh, physical and mental health. And luckily, we have multiple communities that represent almost all of the planning service areas in Illinois. Um, so a good resource for you to think about is to go to the ilbrainhealth.org. You can find the communities around you, and there will be names of individuals that represent the communities and the community multisectoral groups that have been meeting to try to think about how their community can be friendly. If your community is not listed there, you can be involved in helping to make your community dementia friendly. And then the other way you can go is to the Illinois Area Agencies on Aging Map. So there is funds that come from federal uh, groups to provide an Alzheimer's disease uh, resource centers at uh, area agencies on aging, and they're always a nice resource. I've also find li libraries to be very helpful and engaged around dementia-friendly efforts over time. So some action items to take, you know, is one thing is to just encourage like that walkthrough in your clinic about what it would feel like if somebody had dementia or their caregiver and how they would engage in the space and with the teams. Um, you can do a simple thing by asking yourself and the team to go to Dementia Friends USA spend 10 minutes and, and recognize yourself as becoming a dementia friend. Maybe somebody in the clinical team can also help because what we found is that a lot of the caregivers just felt their doctor was the only person that was helping them through the process and they didn't utilize the entire team in the office uh, and see that they were helping them. And so having somebody on the team maybe learn to become a member of a Dementia Friends Champion so they could give presentations in the clinic around dementia friendly or in the community could be helpful. And you can also get involved as a clinic uh, and being part of the multi-sectoral approaches to make your community dementia friendly. Um, and with that, I really want to say that, you know, the detection of dementia is really a primary care physicians can lead this effort, and it's an integrated approach that we need. The four C's and the four M's, along with what our wishes are in the plan of care for somebody with dementia, can be put together to make that process of diagnosis and getting to a plan a little bit more streamlined and friendly. We're gonna always have to think about cultural and linguistic and contextual factors for where our clinics are based. And we are an integral part of dementia friendly communities. And if we do this right, and it's not gonna happen overnight, but if we can work together on this, we can reduce some of those numbers the next time the IDPH does this survey um, about how many people are talking with their primary care physicians about their memory concerns. And we can change that statement about where the majority of primary care physicians feels they're coordinating and providing uh, continuity and first access to care um, and the four C's for people with dementia and at risk for it. And that the care partners recognize that that is a service we uh, provide and a vital service we provide. Uh, for more information, I mentioned it, you can go to the Brain Trust Project and that's always a good resource. And I left my information in the slides. And with that, I'll stop and see if we have time for any questions. I know we kind of are right at the hour. Um, yeah, so I will, um, just a, a question, Dr. Shah, do you think that we should be making questions about cognitive concerns. Should that be a standard part of any visit with our elder patients? Should we be doing some sort of a cognitive screen, maybe a mini cog for all of our patients who are elderly? Do you think that that's something that would be evidence-based and be reasonable for us to be doing? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. And I think what we have to just change our mindset around is that there's enough people that are in that 15 year, you know, that 15 month period that they're ex they know they're having cognitive concerns or their family knows they're having cognitive concerns, but they're not talking about it with their physicians. So it's not necessarily about 
the concept of screening, because right now the U.S. Preventive Task Force Services says there's not enough evidence to screen every asymptomatic person over age 65 for dementia or Alzheimer's disease. But what we're really doing here is early detection. There's a lot of people out there that are feeling something is not right. And if we can encourage them to talk about it and then uh, follow up on it, that can make a difference. So I really do recommend, even you know, even if it's not necessarily a, a first tool, at least asking about it in, in the annual wellness visit. You don't have to, but I, I would recommend it because it's just such an important feature that we, people have a stigma around and don't always bring up. And if we can help them to bring it up, that would be great. Um, uh, so we're really thinking about that early detection and then working through that process. And when you do early detection, you know, having some basic tests, pen and paper tests to kind of gauge if somebody's having some problems and putting that into your note along with what they're telling you um, can really be helpful. And there's a lot of different ideas in that space. Um, so just looking through the chat here, um, Dr. Benson, Janice Benson has said, great talk, we need this at FMM, Family Medicine Midwest, focusing on the community slash office dementia friendly strategies to change our environments. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Benson. And uh, yeah, happy to do this. I'm pretty passionate about like how we can do this work. I know there's a lot of other people that are in the space too. I think we as primary care physicians can really take a lead. Um, I know we have a lot on our plates with different things, but um, this is a really, this is the public health problem of older adults and uh, their families and their communities. And uh, we are th their advocates. And uh, if there's some way that we can, uh, you know, encourage more of us to, you know, wherever we're at in our training in family medicine, to spend a little bit more time thinking about what it means to be a dementia friendly office, um, uh, and creating our settings, we can uh, we can do dramatic things with very little change in my mind. All right, so I don't see anything else in the chat. Um, so I think that I should wrap it up. Um, once again, thanks to our panelist, Dr. Shaw, for his expertise and his wisdom. Um, and I hope that this was helpful to everyone in some way to sort of, you know, better care for our patients who have dementia. Great. Thank you, everybody.